Welcome to View From The Top podcast, where we help growth-minded men who desire momentum in their business, their family, and their finances get through the valleys and up the mountain to their very own View From The Top. Hey, I'm so glad you are with us again today listening in. Uh, Man, I know that we are all looking for ways to simplify our life. And often as business leaders, And we just make things too complicated. So today we're going to dive into three unsuspecting ways that we can simplify our lives. Uh, But before I do, I just want to share a quick story about Joel. Uh, Joel just recently posted about his journey in the ISI app community. And man, he shared about how he was thinking he was a Christian some years ago and how that didn't make him one. And man, I tell you what, Joel went through in this whole list of things about how uh, his journey through faith over time and how he's come to a place. And he posted that he got baptized with his son uh, in there. And he walked through us that that whole story and we all got to congratulate him and celebrate with him. And uh, man, Joel just kind of walked away with the takeaway was we praise God in diversity and just the other challenges that that God helped him overcome before prior to salvation. And I think, uh, as Joel stated it so well, too often we trust God for our Trinity, but not for today. So I'm grateful for a community of growth-minded, committed businessmen in the community. And you can check it out for yourself at viewfromthetop.com slash community and use the checkout code VPOD. That's VPOD. Just for the pod listeners, that's you and our audience and you'll be granted a 30% discount. So go check that out. All right, let's get moving in the podcast. We want to get Big A in, and he's going to introduce our guest, our co-host that's with us today as well. Big A, welcome. Wally, I hope you're doing well. Uh, We've got Charlie Cicchetti with us today. Man, I couldn't be happier. It's going to be really impactful, to be honest with you. Charlie's been a good friend of ours, Wally and mine both. Charlie's been in uh, the community for like a decade now. I look back now and think, Charlie, this is unbelievable that you've been around for 10 years. But I think it's going to be a blast today uh, because we've been on this entrepreneurial journey with Charlie, and we've really watched how God uh, has blessed him in in immeasurable ways. Uh, He had a really successful exit not too terribly long ago. We're going to touch on that just a little bit. But At the end of the day, what we want to talk about is three different unsuspecting ways that you can simplify your life. So, Charlie, thanks for being with us today, man. How you been? Gentlemen, great to see you. Big A, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, Yeah, almost 10 years ago, Moon River Ranch, Big A there in the middle (laughs) of nowhere, Texas, that first ISI retreat. And uh, I just want to thank both of you first for you know, always being an encouragers. Uh, you know, Kevin, it's been great to see what you're helping Big A build here in our community and our brotherhood, and it just means a lot. So thank you. And Big A, just, you know, I love it when you randomly call me and I just needed to hear you and uh, call me there. And I, I hope you feel the same if I ever call you. You know, okay, I got to answer the phone. Charlie's calling. So, oh, man, <laughs> uh, what, I do. What, what <laughs> every a, time, every time. <laughs> what a wild year. Um, First, life's about timing, and uh, after 15 years in the green building space, two small businesses, we grew them to about 75 employees between both. Uh, we did have a successful exit, so I know we're going to talk about that, but uh, just just excited to be here, share a little bit of my story, and hopefully some others can relate to it and uh, be encouraged. Yeah. Well, Charlie, I'm really encouraged, man, first of all, that you're here, but I have to tell a quick story because you were there for the first time. I took about 50, 60 guys to Moon River Ranch in Texas. And I've learned an important, uh, never take guys somewhere you haven't been yourself, right? Because we're going down these dirt roads, Charlie's in a BMW or something, and we're going through mud holes and we're trying to get to this Moon River Ranch. But it ended up, Charlie, you'll have to admit here publicly, it was a phenomenal place. I mean, the place was beautiful. Just getting there was a little bit of a challenge. I had a little business in Dallas, and then it didn't dawn on me when I rented. It was an Audi. I was feeling good at the rental car place, and then all of a sudden, I'm <laughs> mapping it to Waco, Texas, and I've only met these guys in January. It's March. Oh, man, what I get myself into, but we, I, I'm so glad, and I have lasting friendships uh, from that first retreat, yeah. and, and actually, you had me do a, a TED Talk there, and that's where everybody got to see me talk about some things I'm passionate about, and uh, so glad that, that I was there. You crushed it. You crushed it. That was good. 
Hey, man, catch us up. Tell us what's been going on uh, over the past few years and uh, give the audience a little context of the reason that we had you on today. Yeah, super quick background, though. Small town Georgia. Got a scholarship to Georgia Tech. Grateful for that. But really got a business degree from Georgia Tech, even though it's a great construction engineering school. But I worked in commercial construction. That's where I interned, graduated, and started my career. Commercial buildings, commercial construction. Worked for a real estate developer. And they were an early adopter of LEED in green buildings. If you guys or any of the listeners walk into a building, it has this big plaque that says L-E-E-D. That means this has been stamped as a green building. It's better for the environment. It's better for your operating expenses. Save water, save energy, and so much more. You know, 2008 happened. That forced me and a couple of business partners to start our own business. Um, no better time to start our business. Uh, I was a little worried at the time. And, and you know what? It was a blessing in disguise. And uh, for the last 15 plus years, we built up our small businesses. One was a consulting and engineering firm that goes into all these buildings around the U.S., some international. And the other one's an e-learning company that I bought, and uh, we changed it to a subscription model. So I had these two companies serving the same industry. And um, over the last three and a half, four years um, coming out of the pandemic, uh, even during the pandemic, I also started, I'm proud to have co-founded two technology startups here in Atlanta. And so that's one of my pieces of advice for someone that maybe one day wants a partial or full exit is you have to start working on your next identity. I think I've heard that from both of you gentlemen, for example, is if you get a little bit of money here and you've lost that subject matter expertise, you were the boss, you're a little bit successful as a business owner and you don't have that next thing, you know, you can get pretty bummed out. So the more I heard that from circles of friends that have exited or you guys, for example, the more I knew I needed to be intentional. And so I I had next to me technology startup co-founder, even though I wasn't in that business day to day and I have my own podcast and, and I still love to teach in industry. And so, so I feel I was building up some identity along the way. And that would be my first tip <clears throat> that gave me confidence to maybe take a partial exit. So really uh, early 2023, we had these two green building companies, almost 75 employees between both of them really nailing it on our growth and our EBITDA. We really, we broke through, we got into the different layers of leadership we had a president over each company. That's my next tip <clears throat> is make sure you really do empower someone to really run the day-to-day operations and where are you really best going to help those businesses back. My role was more strategy, business development, travel around the world and, and just get awareness to not just what we do, but help this industry. Came really close to selling in early 2023 uh, to a large company, Blackstone, and they put together a SWAT team and a bunch of money behind it. The multiples were going to be really good and And that didn't work out. And so my wife came around the corner after they broke up with me on a Zoom call one late afternoon. That's when people break up with you and say, I'm not going to buy your company. And uh, and next thing you know, uh, she said, look, we, so this was early 23, guys. Here's my next piece of advice. My wife said, look, we aren't ready to get a windfall. We need to learn a little more about money. And Mm. in my house, you know, I'm the breadwinner. My wife does an amazing job with the kids volunteering. It's like a full-time job at the high school band, but she pays the bills here. And so we balance each other out. Even though I think we're pretty good with money, um, she was right. We, we needed to learn about money. And so, and then the other thing was, she said, I wasn't ready for someone else to cut my unlimited PTO or change some perks that I've built up this mm-hmm. amazing culture. And she said, I'd get my, you know, panties in a wash, excuse me, uh, or something like that. So for the next year, we just kept running the business well, and um, and I worked on those two things to get mm-hmm. ready. But we weren't for sale, um, but then we got approached by a strategic, and we can pick up there later. That's pretty cool. Charlie, I want to go back a little bit. Uh, you said you started uh, 15 years ago. Is that right? Yeah, I started our first company about 15 years ago. Yep, so you've right. been married three years at that point. Uh, uh that's yeah. right. You've done your research. 18 yeah, yeah, years. About three yeah. years. All right. <laughs> yeah. About how many? Yeah, you're like, you're like, wait a second. How long have I been married? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw <laughs> you took a minute there. That's all I mean, good. You got it. You got it. And yeah. did you have any kids when you started the business? Uh, yeah, it was, it was a fascinating time uh, uh, in 2008. Tough year for a lot of people, right? We had uh, bought our first house together in January 2008. We had our first son, Blake, in June 2008, and I got laid off from a 2,000-person real estate development company in November 2008. And then a few months after that, we started our first business. So, yeah, we had Blake. He was less than a year old when we uh, filed filed our first LLC, which is a new hobby of mine, by the way. But go ahead. There's a lot of – so the reason I asked you that is I wasn't 100% sure of the answer. So maybe it's not a great question to to ask. But in your answer, there are a lot of guys listening to this podcast today 
that are right where you were 15 years ago. They're on that cusp of like, hey, maybe they're started. So they're in the early startup stage. They haven't even got to growth stage yet. But point is, is like another example of like, hey, you know, you're overnight 15 year success. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, how that works. Uh, yeah, so congratulations. So our first office, uh, I was a starter home just outside of Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath ranch. And out back, it had this 300-square-foot building. You know, some guys have a man cave. My wife said I had a man hut. And this little <laughs> hut out back. And our first five shit. employees, that's right. <laughs> our first five employees would actually park in our driveway, come around back. There was a boardwalk. And we had our first office there for our first, you know, that. couple of years, but there was no bathroom. So you had to come into our kitchen from the backyard mm -hmm. and use the bathroom or make some coffee. And we just had a little naked kid running around, you know, that was just, that was just <laughs> the life we had at the time to get our company started. That's so good. That's uh, those are good memories. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, hopefully I can be an encouragement to guys that are in the early stages of, uh, of their businesses. Charlie, we don't want to paint a picture that everything is just beautiful today, which it is good for you and you've got successful companies. I want to get into talking about schema just in a few minutes. But what, what I do want to ask is take us back about 10 years. You and I had numbers of conversations. Um, it always wasn't pretty, right? There was challenges. There was some tough times early on. Uh, how did you work through those difficult things? To Kevin's point, there's people listening right now that they're alone, they're in isolation, and they have similar problems. They're facing financial challenges, they've got relationship problems, they're starting a new business. Like, what would be a tip or advice to people that could help them work through those scenarios? Yeah, life does not seem simple for them right now, for sure. No, it does. The people, human nature, we all need encouragement, but entrepreneurs need more encouragement than anybody. It's hard. Um, two years stand out, Big A, Kevin, uh, 2016, 2019. So 2016 uh, had two companies, uh, and uh, they both at the same time had some cash flow issues. And man, that was stressful because, you know, LLC passed their entities. That kind of put a little pressure on me and my wife financially. And uh, there were months where I skipped you know, getting paid. And I just, you know, I really didn't want to do that. My wife's love language is acts of service and consistency. She loves it when I make her coffee and she didn't ask. And she loves it when we have a little money in savings and she married the crazy entrepreneur. I'm really happy that we, we did have a, a capital event this year and I've been able to deliver back to her a little peace of mind. Um, and then over here, I just, uh, I just had to work. I, I, had to, I, had to, I had to not just work harder in that moment. It's hard to work smarter, but I'm good at sales and I just, I just hit the road. I, you guys know, I spent a lot of time in New York city. I just, I just went and, and that put a little pressure on the, the household, but you've got to over communicate. This is a Gary Vaynerchuk thing over communicate, especially in your closest relationship. There is, um, Hey, this is what I got coming up. <clears throat> this is what's going to be needed. Don't do it a day before or a week before, but just, you know, Hey, I'm taking that big trip to New York. I uh, just, just want to let you know ahead of time. And I, at least with my spouse, Latrice, who's been amazing through this journey, as long as I've somewhat communicated a little bit ahead of time so she can process it, it's just more accepting. I'm sure that is with your brides too, guys. Um, so 2016 was tough. We got through it, started growing. 2019, that's what you're talking about, Big A. I was ready to sell everything. I'm like, ah, just give me a million bucks. I'm done. I'm, you know, I'll go do something else. That's not enough to to, to not work, but I just, uh, just was too stressful and had a lot of business debt over here when I, the company I bought, you know, $32,000 a month payments, not the faint of heart you know, for the faint of heart over here. And and then I had some business partner issues over here and I had a toxic employee that I had to fire. And I just just had a, had people that I trust <clears throat> that I could at least talk to about it. Even if I'm not going to listen to their direct wisdom or advice, at least I had someone to talk to about it. And, and I got to give it a shout out. Always been close, not just with a couple mentors locally in Atlanta, but uh, ISI really helped me there at the time. So um, stayed the course, took care of some business, uh, got rid of that one employee that was toxic and uh, bought out one of my business partners. 2020 rolls around, I'm feeling like, okay, I did that tough thing and then a damn pandemic hits and uh, <clears throat> and I just learned to just be fully transparent and it really challenged my leadership with my team and luckily, and I know not every business can say that, a lot of restaurants, a lot of hospitality, a lot of industries were impacted. My industry, guys, green buildings, healthy buildings, sustainability, 
my phone's ringing, Charlie, how do we make this a healthier building? How do I get people back to my building? Our business boomed. And there was a lot more e-learning too, because these architects weren't commuting to work. They had more, they had newfound time. I, I can catch up on my continuing education units. So our business has actually really grew through the pandemic. Um, one of your questions, guys, is, you know, uh, is there anything, you know, you've done a little differently? And I'd have been a little bolder sooner. I, I had handicapped mm -hmm. myself because I had a a business partner there was only 15%, my mistake. I treat him as if he were a 50-50 partner. That's my mistake. I shouldn't have done that. I should always have respected that person who I still respect to the day. And we have a, a good personal relationship, but I shouldn't have treated him as a 50-50 because they were 15%. That's a mistake um, I made. Rolling into the pandemic, uh, we did do the first batch of PPP. We were impacted. But, you know, what? just having a little bit of money in the bank allowed me to go to my team more confidently and say, hey, we're okay. We also have this. I'm really grateful we're part of the United States here and the SBA in this program. And you know what it did? It allowed me not just to protect jobs, but to go ahead and keep hiring. Mm -hmm. That's what it did for me. And then, man, we just blew up since 2020, and I'm grateful for that. Charlie, you've been around a lot of very successful entrepreneurs through your journey, living there in Atlanta, the mecca for entrepreneurs. You've been in Iron Sharpens Iron Mastermind for a decade around a lot of very successful entrepreneurs. Did, did you ever struggle along the way with fear of missing out, what we call FOMO? Like, how did that play into some of your decision making? Because that's one of the unsuspecting ways that we can simplify our life yeah. is not having FOMO. How did you deal with that? Um, I think having adversity just in life, kind of even childhood, growing up you know, fairly humble in the North Georgia mountains and getting a scholarship, being grateful for that. And so I think some adversity here, but adversity in business, like to know that I'm pretty resilient. And so the answer is, while I still need to work on Big A, a little delayed gratification for some things in my life, um, I, I don't feel I truly wrestle with FOMO about when we talk in a minute, hey, did I need to hurry and sell my company? Is the market going to crash? It just... The answer for me is my own self-confidence, my own self-awareness that, you know what, if I miss this one, I, I know that I will probably get another look, another opportunity. I'm fairly confident that, you know what, um, while this is hard right now, and that might be the easy button, like I, I just have enough self-confidence in what am I capable of and in my control, that has helped me not suffer from like business FOMO, if that makes sense. I, I was able. I was just going to say one more thing about that in regards to what you mentioned earlier. Uh, you you had a big number on the table with Blackstone, and there had to be some FOMO going on at that time uh, when they parted ways. Like that particular situation, how were you able to overcome that? Because you and I had talked about that a number of times. It was going to be a big deal. It's going to do a lot of things for you. It would have been hard for me not to have FOMO mm. in, in that situation. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I, I'll never forget that moment. Um, again, I stand at this desk, the stand-up desk right here. I've been working from home mostly since the pandemic, going to the office kind of one-ish day a week, travel a good bit. And if my wife wouldn't have come around the corner right when I hung up from that 24-minute call, because um, I was immediately feeling – I was going to be like, oh, man, I missed, and, and I don't I don't know. When will we ever get this opportunity again? You're right, Big A. Will it be that that kind of valuation? And, man, she was just right there. I didn't know it, like right here. And she just instantly said, hey, it's okay. We weren't ready. <clears throat> I'm not disappointed. We need to learn about money, and you need wow. to get ready that someone else one day <clears throat> is going to call the shots. And, man, fast forward to when we did sell our company a little over a year later, uh, I needed that. So that helped me in that moment. That's um good. You know, I think um, I knew that our company, it validated our companies were uh, were valuable in the marketplace. And so, because we never still went for sale, right? People had found us. We took the calls. We worked through some due diligence. And we wanted to see, uh, I just had a short list of non-negotiables. And we came close. But, but I'm glad we didn't sell there. They're putting together amazing things with that group. Um, but they'd already bought a couple companies like ours. We'd have been like third on the totem pole. And mm. whereas the strategic that we ended up selling to, we, we are the SWAT team for sustainability work for everything they do in the world. And it's just different. And I'm glad we waited. Charlie, as you were building the business though, um, I'll give you an example of myself. So 
uh, over the 18 years that that I built a business, there were seasons where I would get caught up in FOMO primarily around how I was, like the activity as I was actually doing inside the business. So I get concerned about market conditions. I get concerned about a competitor, uh, right? So I started to have this fear of like, oh man, if I don't do this thing, right? If I don't add this feature or follow this fad, or I don't do this or I don't do that, that I'm going to miss out on something. Um, did you, like that was, that was a real thing for me at different seasons. And by not doing that, right? As I, as, as I matured over time, uh, by not getting caught up in that FOMO, it absolutely helped to simplify, right? My life and just having the mental space and not doing too many things in the business at one time that, that created chaos for everybody else in the organization. Did, did you ever experience any of that or did you like have a really, was it super clearly defined for you the whole time? No, I, I mean, I think every entrepreneur, right, Kevin, has that for a certain period of time until you just just build up that, um, you know, school of hard knocks. Uh, I think the one I hung on to too long was uh, sharpening the pencil on proposals until some of my key lieutenants would come to me and say, hey, now we, we will charge more or worth more. Uh, that small business mindset, you're kind of like, oh, man, what if we don't get that next decent proposal we sent out? And so, so I, t- I hung on to that too long. I should have focused and focused my team on EBITDA sooner. That's one thing I would probably adjust. Um, and so for me, I love creating jobs. And I really love uh, that we had uh, just layers of leadership. Frankly, the, the, the company we sold to saw that Charlie was a nice to have, not a have to have. And that's the dream. And, and, mm-hmm. I, and it took a lot, but we did it. So so I think once I surrounded myself with just a few others, uh, some were small equity owners and some weren't, that we could actually kind of hash out some of these things. That really helped because um, I would just try to observe what are they FOMO on and not me. That's good. Charlie, on, along the way, you're a sharp guy. And I've seen the companies you've created and I've watched the ideas. You're like Wally and I, we get out of the shower, we got three new ideas, right? What kind of boundaries did you build for you personally and professionally so that you didn't get sidetracked by the shiny objects? Yeah, um, tremendous opportunity out there. And now if we have time, we'll talk about the tech startups. I'm learning there's a lot of money in this world and people that will take a bet on your idea and cash. This person has a little track record. Let's go. That's a whole nother conversation. Part two of the podcast, maybe. And, uh, I would say, um, you know, with, with business, I just, I, I needed early to get clear on what am I really good at in the business and what does it need for me? And, and usually that was getting out as much as I'm productive at home in my home office, it's to go be in front of our customers, um, not always selling them, but listening to them. So I just um, that helped me <clears throat> um, just just talking to customers, and um, and then and then I had such a good relationship. If we got into a new um, service or a new technology, I'm not going to hard sell them. I'm be like, hey, uh, you know, this is something else we offer. You may not know, but love to pilot with you. Love to see if and because then. I can help them be tech enabled or I can help them feel entrepreneurial through our relationship. And so at least the companies that, that I've been fortunate to build um, a lot of those we do business with just what we're selling. It's, it's just fun. It's just, it's just, they, they like it when we're calling upon them, you know, I'm not selling them nothing against those that sell doormats or something like that. Right. It's just like, um, and so I, I just, I always maintain that. And I think guys that helped me, um, just realize I need to somewhat stay in this box. And if there's something new, I kind of talk to someone I trust about it. And if it just is like, no, well then I'd have to say not now, you know, I have this whole list of one day, maybe. Kind of a dream list, but these are boundaries that we're looking for that are kind of absolute. um, Right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, internally, I, I, I'm very fortunate to have, both a virtual assistant in the Philippines, Carla, that I've worked with for almost 10 years now. And she uh, produces the podcast, helps with the customer service of our e-learning company. And we meet on Mondays and Fridays via Skype and just just someone there and, and understanding the difference between a virtual assistant and then over here, a full-time executive assistant. And right now I have Jackie, she's been with me two and a half years. And just we just have a routine down on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays. I can get into it later if you want. But just that person, and it helps that she's friends with my wife too, can help set those additional boundaries. And I, I, I'd be happy to just talk about 
you know, getting that additional administrative support. I would not mm-hmm. have been able to do what I did in the last four years without that <clears throat> kind of person or two people helping me. And uh, of course, some, some uh, presidents over each business unit. I wonder, does, does the idea of like those boundaries, it, it doesn't always seem to me that it correlates directly to simplification. Yet at the same time, it's like it simplifies your ability to be able to do other things that that really will have the impact and move the needle that you really want to move. Yeah, I'm a big fan of both kind of big rocks and then just visualization. So um, for me, my routine, while I've pretty much already planned my next week or two for the most part, is uh, on a Sunday, actually usually before church, I'll just go ahead. I use Trello. I'll plan my week and really the things I've got to get done. And, and then I really tell myself and then I tell my executive assistant, like, here's the big rocks for the week. And so what that does is then that Monday morning, one of my hacks is the first two hours, 8 to 10 a.m., <clears throat> just my time. I call it deep work. Uh, Mark Twain quote, right? Eat the frog first thing in the morning. I like to do that first thing in the week. And so just just once I – if we didn't get to something on Friday, I was okay to give myself permission to get back to it Monday morning. That kind of helps free up headspace for the weekend. But um, – I just go ahead and say, look, these things, no matter what, I've got to find time for. So my subconscious, even if something crazy comes up, client call, this uh, employee situation, I, I just know without even looking at my to-do list, I, I really got to get back to that thing because I've, I've narrowed it down to three to five. Just these things will have to get done this week by me. And it kind of my subconscious gets me right back on track. So so if you program in enough of that, then you have to give yourself permission to be creative one thing I'll tell you after the sale, I became more creative. If you want to go there, um, I didn't realize I wasn't as creative. I was very strategic up until mm-hmm. selling our companies, and I feel I made some good calls, but I wasn't as creative until after I sold the company. I didn't really, really, re- I didn't really realize how much it was weighing me down. Mm-hmm. Charlie, do you think that's because of the amount of stress, and you were so yeah. occupied with the strategy, you didn't have time, you didn't have the space to be creative? <clears throat> I think for me, Big A, it was um, a combination of yeah, I've signed up for a lot of things. <laughs> uh, uh, some business debt, which I uh, am totally okay to leverage to scale and build the companies. But but at a certain point, I think it it can it can it's there. Even though you might not think it's there, it's 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 there. It's way on, on me. It was weighing on me. And then uh, due diligence. If we have time to talk about it, you know, it took six months to get our deal done, and that took a lot out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, so those things right there. Still made some good decisions, still took care of the team, <clears throat> uh, gave out some big blessings later. But we closed our deal <clears throat> end of April 2024. And within two weeks, people asked me, how are you feeling? And uh, I just started feeling creative, man. I just started getting ideas. And not even about new business stuff, just just about personal stuff. And So I started to feel a lot more creative. Uh, and we did have a nice win. Um, it's not enough to go sit on the beach I, I wouldn't do that anyway, but it's enough that we gave out a lot of blessings, paid off all the business debt uh, we owe, and um, uh, we, I was able to make a sizable investment into the tech startup that we have 20 employees already going. It's going places. It's amazing, and that's where I, I'm spending time, and I just I just feel good about uh, how the deal finally got there, and uh, it's a deal I would have done again, but you know, it's it's not a it's not a forever capital event, but it's a capital event that I needed to get that first one put up some money to help my wife there with her peace of mind. Remember that acts of service. And, uh, and, and I might not totally admit it, but it's kind of cool to have a little bit of money earning some interest right now. And you guys can teach me about that. Cause you know, that's something new to me. I put all my money into my business over the years and um, I'm glad I did, but now I'm starting to realize, okay, you know, and I need to learn a little bit about investing and things like that. Charlie, I'm going to use a quote on you that you've said to me for about five years, and you said it relentlessly. You said, Big A, one day I'm going to take some chips off the table. You said that over and over and over. Do you think that's a way that we could put into the simplification of your life? It's giving you a sense of peace. There's a little bit of security. It's okay to cash in at some point. So those that are out there today thinking about, man, I'd like to stay here and run my business, but it's a great opportunity. What would you tell people about how this has simplified your life? Yeah, I do think that can help simplify. I'd rank it in this order, Big A, I'd say, uh, because I didn't get to say that we were only looking to sell part of our company. I was kind of excited just to get a little capital in, pay off some debt, finally have some money to like really scale because we had 
ton of momentum. And um, in the negotiations, it was clear if this if we were going to work with this strategic, uh, who's just a great company, it was going to be 100% acquisition. So I needed to kind of have that heart to heart with myself and I have business partners and 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 I did. So, uh, but taking some chips off the table, even if it's just selling part of your company, uh, I think number one, as entrepreneurs, it validates that hard work, that sacrifice, even if it's just selling 10% of your company. So yeah. I think that's the first thing. And then that leads to, oh, we have a little bit of money. We, we might've deferred, you know, buying something or taking that trip, but we also just, even if we just have a little bit to put up in savings, you know, there's a good likelihood those around you, maybe your spouse would appreciate that. And uh, just a little security. <clears throat> and then I think it gets to the simplification after that. You have a little bit more means to maybe even hire that landscape company or that, uh, you know, house cleaner or things like that, that maybe you haven't yet. Yeah, that's really good. Charlie, before we end today, though, I do want to talk a little bit about some of your new initiatives. And I want to be the first to tell you here today, I think it's really cool how you've integrated artificial intelligence into the building information modeling. Uh, when I started really looking through that, diving in, you have really kind of disrupted that industry for the architects, you're making their workflow much easier. Instead of taking months, it's taking hours to be able to do some really creative modeling now. Talk to us a little bit about that. Who's the brainchild behind that ultimately? And tell us a little bit more about uh, how you're disrupting this industry. <clears throat> I wish I'd have paid more attention at uh, Georgia Tech accounting class because uh, service-based <laughs> companies are valued based on a multiple of EBITDA, usually, right? A multiple right. of your profits. Right. Maybe most companies trade for between three and seven times EBITDA in a hot growing green building movement and uh, us scaling and pretty damn cool team I put together amongst good friends. Uh, you know, maybe we sold for somewhere between seven and 10 times EBITDA. So that's pretty cool. But over here, technology companies usually are valued on a multiple of annual recurring revenue and ARR. And, and uh, really, can this be extrapolated? And if I open some doors for you, can, and so next thing you know, the tech companies, um, pretty neat how we get to talk to investors, tell them our story, talk about the team we put together, the technology we've already built, and what what's possible, right? You get to think bigger, faster, then all of a sudden you raise millions of dollars and it's like, go build this thing as fast as you can. Over here, it's, well, we got a little profit on the service company. Let's hire that other person because we really need them. <laughs> Let's get a little more profit, hire that other person. So it was the slow and steady, but it worked out. <clears throat> Over here, it's totally different. So I, I love learning. I love the challenge. And it's a totally different way to build a company now as a tech startup. So um, yeah, how Schema came together. Everybody check it out. Schema, S-K-E-M-A dot A-I. Uh, if I were to do a service-based company again, I would not have a 50-50 partner. And, and luckily, I, I, I just only did that once. I would bring in smaller partners. Um, for a tech startup, it's just different. I, I need help. I don't know how to code. I don't know how to do this. And so just this team came together. Some of my co-founders have been doing this for 25 years. And they actually built, uh, they were on the team that built the most successful product called Revit, Autodesk. You know, you guys probably know CAD, 2D CAD. Well, they built 3D CAD and they sold it uh, in 2002. And that kind of created this architect's draw in 3D now. And they have for the last 20 years. So that team has had success in their career. Some of my co-founders guys have been CEOs of other tech startups. And so <clears throat> we came together through mutual relationships and especially one of my mentors, Errol Wolford, a man of faith. And, uh, and so we just connected the right people and we happened to take over some technology from a team that had building it and been building it in Europe, but they really hadn't made it into a product. And so while the current version of our software is only part of that, it was nice to have a head start five years in the machine learning and AI space. People with a great attitude that wanted this thing they've been working on for so long, but they just haven't figured out how to sell it in the marketplace to architects and developers and the right people here that knew how to sell it because they've done it before. And a crazy guy like me that's pretty resourceful, and I can go find a little money to put behind it. And I think I know how to hire some pretty cool people and say, here's what we're going to do. Um, and that's, that's what schema is. So um, we've got essentially 20 employees. Um, it's not like we just started. And so it's actually been years in development. Last year was our big ramp year, <coughs> uh, getting some additional uh, uh, pre-seed angel funding and then a seed round this year with some strategic investors. And so we've raised uh, about $4 million um, and we are just, we're just going for it, man. And, and we're having fun. Uh, but it is a big, it is a, an AI tool for architects and developers. 
uh, and it'll shave at least two months off of the design of every single commercial building. Um, and just we're taking your greatest hits from your last few projects that were successful. And we're just going to go ahead and give you a head start, about a 60, 70 percent head start on what you would have drawn on this site. And we're going to go ahead and fit it into your site. Then you pick back up and take it from there. I like that because it can give you multiple yeah. options. Yep. And I also and like it that you, you've really covered so many different divisions. You're in healthcare and education, uh -huh. hospitality, residential data centers. I mean, you're covering the whole market, which is really cool <laughs> to see what y'all have done I with that. I appreciate that. that. So that. Cool. And look at you, man. Uh, you said my name right. You've been doing the research. You kind of know what I'm doing. I'm impressed. That's amazing. And, uh, but thanks for the encouragement because I don't know if you noticed, it's the same industry that I just had a little bit of success in. So mm -hmm. now I, right. I go to the architects that I did sustainability work, mm -hmm. to the real estate developers like Heinz out of Houston, Texas, that hired my sustainability company for a 74-story building mm -hmm. in Busan, South Korea, for green building and healthy building certifications. And, and over here, I get to say, hey, here's what I'm up to now. Thank you for trusting me here. If you'd want to take a look at this, I, I think you might like it because that trust transfers. And so luckily, I just didn't totally go to another industry. Some people do. Some people can. For me, I, I'm fortunate that my relationships and that trust is transferring, and now I get to go kind of meet uh, with customers that I've worked with for years, but with a different offering. Charlie, thank you for being here with us today as we've really dove into the three unsuspecting ways that all of us could simplify our lives. So I just want you to think through the listeners as you've listened to this uh, interview. Be sure to go back and listen to it again if you need to, but it's really okay uh, to think through FOMO and how you're going to discover that for you. Fear of missing out is not a fun thing. And as Charlie said, he's taught us how to overcome the fear of missing out. Think about the boundaries that you have. Have you created boundaries? Do you have trusted advisors? Do you have people that on a weekly basis that you can run these things by? Like Charlie said earlier, he had a sounding board and he had boundaries within his family and within his business. And then Finally, the thing that I really like the most personally is how he talked about it's okay to cash in. Like we need to take some chips off the table sometimes, and that is okay because it gives our family a sense of security. It allows us to be more creative. And so I want to encourage you today to think through having FOMO, uh, really thinking through how that you can build those boundaries to help you accomplish your goals and your dreams. And at the end of the day, if you want to take some chips off the table, it's okay. So I just want to thank you for being here today. Remember, go to viewfromthetop.com slash community and join our ISI community. We have ongoing conversations like this each and every day. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time.